How are they sitting on the Hill family? I'm so thankful that we get to spend some time together. God is good. God is on the throne. He is faithful. And even though things happen around us, and even though it might be cold where you are watching right now, I know that Jesus is faithful and He is the one that keeps His promises. I know that we are going to go into this amazing journey where God's just going to come and shift some things in our hearts. He's going to enlarge something of our compassion. We're going to catch more of His heart. And we're going to experience more of what God wants to do in and through us. God's going to show us little opportunities to make a difference. Friends, I'm here to say to you that the friends, the family members, the people at work, the people in your school, they are all people that God has placed there divinely. And God wants to use you and me in specific ways to make supernatural differences in people's lives. I believe that God wants to come and just lift our heads a little bit. God wants to just take our eyes and our focus of all the battles. I'm sure if you're in South Africa focusing on, on ESCOM and some of the load shedding and some of the things that's been happening recently, I know, friends, that this is, this is not easy. And I believe that in the midst of the hardest times, that's where the gospel just takes, takes off. That's where God does supernatural things when it's really tough. I'm thinking of the book of Acts, friends, and I'm thinking of how they lived in the middle of revival and they were living in times of political pressure, times of economic pressure, times of extreme challenge, times of extreme persecution. And it was, it was in that time where the Holy Spirit empowered them. They experienced the move of the Spirit. They experienced God do supernatural things and they could not trust in themselves. They had to trust in God. And so I'm so excited about this new series, Win Some. We're gonna be winning some. God's gonna win people through us. The Bible actually says, He who wins souls is wise. I believe that the Holy Spirit through us wants to win our family, our children, wants to win our parents, wants to win our friends, wants to win people at, at work, wants to win those that we have influence with. God wants to win the hearts of men. And for us to be able to be part of God win winning so many hearts, we need to get, catch the heart of God. So today I want to just pray for us. We're going to get into today's message. Jesus, I want to thank you so much that we could just trust you and Lord, when we don't know what to do, like Jehoshaphat said, our eyes can be on you. I want to thank you for my friends and my family that are so faithful back in South Africa and maybe everywhere else around the world. Thank you that we can be in partnership together. I pray your blessing upon this word in Jesus' name. Amen. Friends, let's get straight into God's word. We are looking at the book of Jonah and we're looking at how Jonah experienced something of a revival, something of a move of God. And I believe that God wants you and me to be part of this end time Revival. Now, sometimes people have really misrepresented revival, misunderstood revival. But if we're going to win some, we need revival. We need the move of the Spirit. We need to be part of what God is doing. Like Bono used to say, the, the, the lead singer of U2, he said, instead of doing our thing and asking God to bless it, we should be asking God what He's doing and join Him because that's already blessed. Friends, you and I, as a believer of Jesus Christ, as a follower of Jesus Christ, we were born for constant revival, constant revival. There's a mandate of God upon the people. When you read the scriptures, when you read the life of Jesus, it's a constant expectation, a constant desire, a constant hunger, a constant openness, a constant uh, real expectation, a longing for God to do what only He can do. And most people have the wrong picture of revival and that's why they never experience it. Friends, if you think revival is limited to a few nights, a week long list of meetings, celebrations in a church building. If you think revival is limited to that, you are so wrong, my friend. I'm here to say to you that revival is way more than that. It could in involve that, but it's not only that. If you think that revival is everyone on the floor in a building um, under the power of the Spirit, I'm telling you, I want the Holy Spirit to touch us and I want to experience His power, but that's not the limit. Revival is not limited to that. If you think it is about meetings going on for hours and hours and hours, I'm here to say to you, there are times I've experienced this with you. There are times when the Holy Spirit moves and we just don't want to go anywhere. But that's not the extent. That's not the, the, the revival is not limited to that only. That might be part. Now, we re really need to see more of that. But it's not the limitation. I believe revival is me needed personally for us and corporately. And um, if you understand the Bible, if we read the scriptures, the Bible is so clear that revival is all about Jesus Christ and His Spirit and the Father's heart being released. Revival is not about man, it's not about flesh, it's not about a cause, it's not about a person, it's not even about a church. Revival is about you and me growing in our passion, our hunger, our desire, our openness to God, and then seeing God do supernatural things. We're going to go into a campaign after this, speaking about purpose 
and how we're going to be able to, to engage in the purposes of God for our lives. And I believe that this series is going to be a, a great opportunity to kind of prepare us for what God wants to do. And I believe that until you and I experience personal revival constantly, constantly daily saying, Holy Spirit, come and minister to me, daily saying, Jesus, reveal yourself to me, daily saying, Father, I want to hear your heart. I want to catch your heart. We're going to struggle. So the first session of this amazing series is we want to catch the heart of God. We need to win the heart of God so that we can need to gain something of the heart of God so that we can win the people in our lives. Um, I want to ask you, what is God's heart when it comes to revival? And what does that mean for you and me personally? What's God's heart? I believe parents, you should be asking God, what is your heart for my children and revival in my home? <laughs> Employees or business owners, you should be asking God, what is your heart? What is your heart for revival in my, in my business and in my workplace? Your student, students or teachers at your schools, Lord, what is your heart? What does revival look like in our schools? Friends, biblical revival is the intensifying of the ordinary works of the Holy Spirit. It's the intensifying. So the Holy Spirit is always working, but we see these manifestations. We see them intensifying, and that's what we're going to trust God for. I believe that there's four things that happen when the Holy Spirit's work is intensified in our lives and in our spheres of influence. Number one, there's a conviction of sin. And we're going to touch on this over the next few weeks. God's not into condemnation, but He definitely convicts of sin, righteousness, and judgment to come. There's a conviction of sin. When we ever see revival, when the Holy Spirit moves, people are convicted of what they need to let go of. Secondly, there's conversion. People become Christ followers. They, they convert. They, they turn from darkness to light. They, they, they turn from trusting in, them, in their idols or in themselves to trusting in God. There's conversion that happens. When the Holy Spirit's work is intensified, there's a, an assurance, like we get an assurance of salvation that gets released in um, in our lives. And this is, this is really, really powerful because it gives assurance of salvation. And then there's a sanctifying that happens. People become more and more like Christ when, when there is revival. People become more and more like Jesus Christ. And so let me give you those four again. It's, it's convicting of sin. It's conversion. People become followers of Jesus. It's giving assurance of salvation. People's uh, salvation, like it says in Romans 8, we're going to touch on that. The Holy Spirit gives you and me assurance the move of the Spirit, the revival in our hearts. And fourthly, there's a sanctifying that happens. We become more and more like Christ. So I'm really going to give you just some things that I've learned over the years from others, and I, I can't remember them all, but I've learned this over the years, is that there's certain things that are marks of revival. So if the Holy Spirit is moving in your life, if the Holy Spirit is moving in our church, if the Holy Spirit is moving in our country, these are the marks of revival. And Michael Eaton said this. He said that he believes that there is a great revival taking place in South Africa and people are not even able to recognize it. There's a great revival taking place right now in this beautiful nation of South Africa. So let's quickly look at the, the marks of revival. Number one, if revival is really taking place, there's a true gospel emphasis. The gospel is all about Jesus Christ, the King, and what he, not only who he is, who Jesus is, but also what he came to do. It's the good news about Jesus. It's a brand new identity in him. And it is the kingdom of God coming in and through our lives. Who is Jesus in your life? Have you experienced the gospel, the revival? When revival happens, when there's a move of God's spirit, I want to say this, for people to be one, we need to be one. Our hearts need to beat faster. Our, our gaze need to light up at the thought of Jesus. We need to look to him and we are radiant. There's this old story I've heard someone tell once about a father and a boy walking on the beach. And the father and the boy are walking and they're talking to one another. And there's a sense of connection between the dad and his young son, his little boy. There's a sense of connection. They're able to talk to one another. They're able to connect with one another. But then there's this moment where the son turns to the dad and lifts up his arms and the dad picks up the son. And the dad squeezes the son tight. And the son's ear goes onto the dad's chest and the, the son hears the father, the, his father's heartbeat, and the son can feel the father's embrace, and the son's experiencing security, the son's experiencing safety, he's experiencing acceptance, the son's experiencing affirmation, he's experiencing affection. And so it's amazing how the son went from knowing that he has a father to experiencing his father. He's, he's gone from knowing the good news that my father loves me to experiencing 
the good news. Friends, that's a sign, that's a trademark, that's a mark of revival, is that you and I don't only know the gospel, but we experience the gospel. We don't only know about how God, good God is, we experience his goodness. We don't only know about what he's done for us, we experience it firsthand. It's amazing. Revival has to happen in me. Friends, you and I need to experience more of the closeness of our Father. It starts with you and me experiencing the gospel. Romans 8 verse 18 actually says that the Spirit testifies with our spirit that we are children of God. There's this inner witness. There's this experience. There's this close encounter. That's why I believe it's so important. This is one of the marks of revival. The second mark of revival is true repentance. Now, here's the thing, friends. Repentance has become a swear word in the, in the, in the Western world, in the Western church. People are like, no, you know, I'm amazing. I'm perfect. There's nothing wrong with me. Actually, the truth be told is, friends, yes, in Jesus Christ, you and I are fully righteous. But repentance is, Lord, I want to keep on. I want to keep on pursuing your radical, amazing, high point, the place, my, my position in Christ. I want to repent back to who I really am because sometimes I get distracted. Repentance is turning from what I know or what distracted me back to Jesus, turning my eyes on Jesus. Repentance is about saying, Lord, I own what I did wrong. I want to let go of that. I want to turn from what's not me and I want to turn to you. Friends, South Korea experienced a powerful revival. South Korea is one of the most Fastest growing, uh, the nations with the Christianity is the fastest growing in the world. South Korea is where Yonggi Cho was. Millions upon millions upon millions of believers. South Korea went from um, literally 0% Christian to more than 40% of their nation. Truly born again, believing followers of Jesus. From 0% to more than 40% in a number of a few years. And you know why? One of the reasons historians tell us is that when the gospel started penetrating, when the gospel came in, when revival happened, the Korean, South Korean revival, when it happened, what happened was they started repenting. And they did not only repent, but they also went and said, said, repented to the Chinese because of what they've stolen. And they, their repentance was real. Their repentance was raw. And the, the fruit of that, the mark of that was real repentance. And the fruit was phenomenal, phenomenal growth and impact. The third mark of revival is that we have anointed corporate worship. Friends, this is what I love about City on Hill. I can't tell you how I miss worshiping with you in the building. If you're not getting to a City on Hill building, I want to encourage you to make every effort to get there this weekend and worship with your family. What I love about City on Hill's worship is it's, it's real, it's raw, it's authentic, it's passionate, it's full of fire, full of the presence of God, full of the power of God. It's anointed worship, corporate worship. My friend Ashley Bell says, every revival that he's ever studied involved and included powerful, anointed corporate worship. In 1 Corinthians chapter 14, we see how Paul writes and he says, he says, when God is in our midst, people fall on their faces and say, truly, God is with you. <laughs> City on the old church. I know you're watching me online, but I want to say this to you. You need to be in corporate worship. And revival, a mark of revival is when it's the Spirit of God breaks out and God is in our midst. That's what we want. The fourth mark of revival is there's always church growth. We see in Acts chapter 4, uh, Acts chapter 9, verse 31, it actually speaks about the churches multiplying and, and they, 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 they're growing in the fear of God and they're under the power of the Holy Spirit. And the Bible says, and multitudes got added. Many people got saved. So many people got impacted. There's church growth. People are going to be added. Can I prophesy this over you, City on Hill? Enlarge the place of your tent. Get ready. You are busy being stretched. Why? Because God wants to bring multitudes of new salvations, of people being born again, young people, old people, and different races, different cultures, different genders, different backgrounds. God wants to get them saved. God's going God's to use you as a, as a soul-winning machine, City on Hill. And uh, I believe that that's part of revival is we see church growth. And the last part uh, expression of revival, and I love this about City on Hill, is this extraordinary prayer. Prayer is always involved when revival, when the Spirit of God moves, the people of God pray. And when the key people of God pray, the Spirit of God, it, it's, like, it's like His move unlocks prayer, and that prayer grows us in our experience of the move of God. In New York City, New York City experienced a phenomenal revival, friends. Such a powerful revival. And it was birthed out of business people, not pastors, not church buildings, business people saying, let's take a lunch break and let's pray together. I want to ask you, 
When last did you say, listen, Lord, I'm only going to take 20 minutes. I'm going to pray with my, with, with my family. I'm going to pray with, how about families praying together? How about business owners praying together? How about teachers praying together? How about doctors and medical professionals praying together? How about people in, 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 in the marketplace and, and entrepreneurs and, and, and people in, 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 in corporate positions and lawyers praying together? How about people coming to, together to pray? Within two years in New York City, more than 80,000 people became followers of Christ because there was this prayer move of the Spirit. I believe that prayer and revival go together. The Welsh Revival was such a powerful move of God. We've t- spoken about it so many times uh, that actually industry were impacted. Um, drinking places were emptied. Prisons were getting empty because people just didn't want to commit crime any, em- anymore. There were radical salvations. Why? Because people's hearts were one. People's hearts were won by God, by the Spirit. And then by the Spirit of God, they said, we are now empowered by the Spirit to be witnesses. And others were won to the gospel of Jesus Christ. So friends... I believe God wants these marks of revival to manifest in our midst. And that's why we're coming into Jonah. It's, what are the effects of revival? What would be the fruit of that? Three effects of revival that I want to share with you. Number one, sleepy Christians are awakened. And now if you are with someone, tell them, wake up, wake up. I believe that sleepy Christians need to wake up. People that are, have been kind of like, kind of like just drifting along, being asleep. And <laughs> Sorry, sorry for my sound effects. But the truth be told is God wants us to rise, to wake up. God wants an awakening to take place in and amongst people that have been asleep, Christians that have been asleep. There's also an amazing thing. The effects of revival is people that were kind of like nominal Christians saying they're Christians, but they did not really know God. Those people get supernaturally uh, converted. They get converted from being just confessing, but not really being to really becoming fully devoted followers of Jesus. And then those that are hard to reach, this is the third um, effect of revival, the hard to reach, hard-hearted criminals, people that are far from God, atheists, people that are radical sinners become radical believers of Christ because that's the effects of revival. Revival makes the church attractive and powerful. Revival is a move of God that includes miracles, signs, and wonders. I would say that powerful outpourings of the Spirit is what, what we need to be contending for, we need to be trusting for, we need to be open for, because that's definitely evident when revival happens. So let's get to Jonah chapter one, and we're just gonna take a few verses from Jonah today, but over the next few weeks, we're gonna unpack this whole book, and we're gonna see how God involved Jonah in revival. Now, here's the thing, friends, I'm here to say to you that you and I today, I wanna ask you, even though Jonah was a sign pointing to Jesus, I've been reading a book called The Prodigal Prophet by Tim Keller speaking about Jonah. And it's been touching me personally because I'm finding it so many ways I'm just like Jonah. And, and I'm here to say to you, could I ask you, by the grace of God, could you take a few weeks, go on a journey with us as a church, and could we bring our hearts to God and say, God, something of my heart needs to shift. I need to catch something of your heart because clearly... I'm a lot like Jonah and I, I'm, I'm often thinking of life fleshly and in temporary ways and in preference and I actually want to catch your heart and I don't want to be distracted by my fleshly desires. Let's go to Jonah chapter 1 verse 1. It says, The word of the Lord came to Jonah, son of Amittai. Go to the great city of Nineveh. Listen to this. The word of the Lord came to Jonah. Friends, this is one thing I've learned. Who is the word? Jesus Christ. In the beginning was the word. The word was with God. The word was God. That's John chapter one, verse one. The Bible says that Jesus Christ is the word made flesh, John 1, 14. And that means that when the word of the Lord comes, it's like Christ coming to Jonah. I'm here to say to you through this series and through the word of God, every morning of your life, every day that you spend time with Jesus, the word of the Lord will come to you. Jesus will come to you through his word. Jesus will come to you through his spirit. And he will say to you, I want, I've got a specific area or a specific people or a specific person or even a specific um, space that I want you to come and share my word. I want, to be, I want you to be part of what I'm doing. And I want to ask you, how will we respond? He says, go to that great city, the city of Nineveh. He calls that city great. Why? Because God loves cities. Now, if you find yourself in Potchefstroom or you find yourself in Clarkson, I'm here to say to you, for, oh, for me in, in Charlotte, God loves cities. Why do I say that? Because God died for people. Cities are made up of people. And Jesus is passionate. He's loving. He loves 
people. And if you're a person, if you're breathing, if you still have a pulse, I'm here to say to you that God loves you because He loves you, because He loves you. He loves you so much that He gave Himself, that He poured out His, His very self for you and me. And in Jonah chapter 4, verse 11, so it starts with God saying, this great city in Nineveh, and then it ends, and God is speaking to Jonah and saying, in the middle, we're going to read the story of Jonah and how God journeyed with Jonah. But the beginning starts with God's heart for the city. The end shows again, God closes with his heart for the city. He says, should I not pity? Should I not have a heart for Nineveh? That great city in which are more than 120,000 people, persons. God is saying there's 120,000 individuals that represent families, that represent histories, that re represents futures and destinies. There's 120,000 of my own that I love deeply. He says, who cannot discern between their right and their left and they don't have any righteousness. And I want to be their righteousness, but they don't have any righteousness in them. Unless I step in to their darkness, they'll never know what the light is. All they know is darkness. All they know is unrighteousness. And I want to bring righteousness to them. And he says, and there's men, much livestock. There's much resources. I'm not only concerned for them. I'm also concerned for the livestock, the things that I use to sustain them. I want to sustain them. Verse 2 of Jonah chapter 1 says, and preach against it because its wickedness has come up before me. Friends, I'm here to say to you that God does not call us to preach against so that we can condemn. God calls us to preach against for the purpose of redemption, for the purpose of restoration, for the purpose of revival, for the purpose of, of rejoining, of revealing the righteousness of God to people. It's not to bring people down, but it's to bring people to restoration. It's, it's the purpose is for the best of the people. It's like, it's like being disciplined. You don't get disciplined for the sake of being hurt. You get disciplined for the sake of freedom and of future and of destiny. Jonah, I'm here to say to you, friends, that Jonah would have gone to Nineveh if it was all about condemnation. Because Nineveh, you'll see next week, was a very bad city with, with, with very bad people living in, in that city. And that, those people were so evil that Jonah just could not believe that God would be merciful to them. So if God said, go and preach to them so that I can condemn them, he would have been the first to go. But God, he knew. God's not saying preach to them so that I can condemn them. Actually preach to them so that I can be merciful to them. Because see, we as the church, we don't preach condemnation. Romans 8 verse 1 says, there's now therefore no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Those who walk according to the Spirit, not in the flesh. God actually wants us in the spirit, and he wants, he says, he wants us to bring conviction. Conviction is there to, to build up, is to bring people into repentance, into the penthouse. Condemnation is to take people down to the pit of self pity and despair. No, God wants conviction. It's amazing for me how Jonah really, the message that Jonah had to preach really is, is, the, is the gospel. And the message that you and I need to preach is Ephesians chapter 2. It's found in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 1 to 10. And I don't have time to unpack it completely. But if you want to know what message your family needs to hear, you need to know Ephesians chapter 2, verse 1 to 10. He says in verse 1, he says, He made us alive. We were dead in our trespasses and sins, and He made us alive. He says, we once walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince and the power of the air, the spirit who now works in the sons of disobedience, among whom we also once conducted ourselves in the lust of the flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature children of wrath, just as the others. Paul's writing and he's saying, friends, I'm here to say to you that God wants to make you alive because he made us alive. And the key for us to share this word for the key for us to be like Jonah and to say, Lord, I'm not going to run away, but I'm actually going to engage in the revival you want to bring about in my friends and my family. For me to win some amazing people, the key is that you and I would be remembering that we've been made alive. And we must remember that we were dead, but now we're alive. And the people we're talking to, friends, sinners are supposed to sin because that is their identity. They're sinners. You and I are sons and daughters of the Most High God who make mistakes, who happen to sin from time to time of which we then can repent. But we don't, our identity is not sin. Our identity is righteousness. Their identity is sin. Their identity is unrighteousness. And so we can bring new life to them. Their identity is death. Our identity is life. I'm here to say to you, don't forget where you come from. Everyone has a past, but Jesus has a future 
for everyone. Remember what God has done for you. And if you're far from God today and you're watching this, this online, I'm here to say to you, good news. Jesus Christ wants to bring you out of death and into life. Verse 4 to 7 of Ephesians chapter four, uh, 2 says, but God, can you say but God, you and I do not do the saving. God does the saving. You and I do not do the changing of lives. God does the changing of lives. He's rich in mercy because of his great love with which he loved us. Even when we were dead in our trespasses, he made us alive with Christ. By grace, you have been saved and raised us up together and made us sit together in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Friends, there's so much happening here. He's saying, God who loved us, made us alive. Um, he raised us up together. Friends, that's the message that you need to bring to your friends and family. He says, you were dead, but I've got awesome news for you. Not me, not your goodness, not your religion, but God wants to raise you up. And he doesn't only want to raise you up. He wants to put you back in the penthouse, in the heavenly places. He wants you to be in him, in heavenly places. And he wants to show you the exceeding riches of his grace he wants to show you his kindness oh man i'm getting excited man he wants to show you his kindness friends what kindness that's in christ jesus oh wow that's god that's the god we serve that's the message we preach revival is when you and i recognize where we come from we recognize who god is in his faithfulness what he has done for us we recognize that he raises he raises us up we recognize that we are seated in heavenly places with Him. Our identity shifts from darkness to light, from death to life, from unrighteousness to righteousness, from being a slave, being a sinner, to being a son and a daughter of the Most High God. The reason why Jonah didn't want to go is he didn't want people to have what he had. And the reason why sometimes we don't want to speak to that, that, that uncle or that, that cousin or that friend of ours or that co-worker is because we don't like them and we don't want them to get the freedom and the joy that we had. Or we forget how much God has done for us. The enemy wants you to forget. And I'm here to say to you, please don't forget. Because religion says people must do, do, do so that God can love them. But relationship says Jesus has done what you and I need. And that's why God loves us. God loves us because he loves us. Because he died for us. Because he loves us. And because he is faithful even when we are faithless. Verse 8 to 10 says, For by grace you have been saved through faith. Revival, move of the Spirit. We're going to win our friends not by works, but by grace. And our salvation is not by our works, but it's by grace. Saved through faith and not of ourselves. It's a gift of God. Not of works so we can boast. For we are His workmanship, created in Christ Jesus. Listen to this, friends. For good works that God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. Friends, we and, you and I are going to win some people. We're going to win many by the Spirit of God. The Spirit of God through us is going to make a difference. And it's because these good works have been prepared for us and we're just going to walk in them. That's revival. That's revival, friends. Revival is not you and me just, just going to some meeting and being passive and just sitting in a row. No, revival is when it happens in us. Then it starts happening through us. Then it starts happening around us. Verse 3 says, But Jonah ran away from the Lord and headed for Tarshish. Friends, I'm here to say to you, that God does not want you and me to run away from His great call. He wants you and me to know that you and I have been born for revival. My prayer is that none of us will miss the opportunity that God's presenting to us right now. And none of us, I'm asking you, maybe you need to make a list. Maybe you need to sit down and just write down five names of people that, that you want the Holy Spirit to win through you. Five names of people that you're going to invite to, to maybe a special moment. Five names of people that some people are, they've just burnt stones. They knew God or maybe they still know God, but they're bitter. They've, they're struggling with unforgiveness. They got offended in the church. Maybe you just say, God, come and do a revival in me. And then these five names, names Lord, let me share your fire, your love, your grace with them. If you're far from God today, today is your day of salvation. Today is the day where you can say, Lord, be merciful to me. I need your salvation. I want you to take me out of death, and bring me back into life. In Jesus' mighty name. I'm praying for you right now. God, I speak your blessing over my family and my friends. And today I thank you that we can grow knowing you, experiencing you, and being revived by you. Lord, we want to catch your heart. Lord, give me your heart. I want to catch your heart. Break my heart for what breaks yours. In the mighty name of Jesus. Amen.